Um, I, mean, I think if you, if you look at uh, a climate summit, then um, it's quite a strange affair. One thing you notice um, is that all the documents, so they're describing their, their national country, so they'll talk about the people they have, the, the resources, the forms of energy, the forms of transport, essentially all the features of a nation. Um, and they describe it, but they describe it from one point of view only, which is the amount of a gas that it produces. So it's the CO2 emissions <coughs> from all these activities, which is the only um, angle and perspective from which the nation is assessed and is presented into this international fora. And the, the, the terms in which the discussions occur um, are very much uh, an abstraction from, from that nation, from the kind of specific features of that nation. And the leaders very much leave their populations behind, leave the things they might want, uh, the reasons they might do things, um, the, the ways in which they live. They leave all those elements behind um, and they deal with each other solely. Um, and they deal with each other solely um, in, 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 terms of, in terms of the CO2 emissions, which are only, the, in a way, the opposite of what people would have meant or wanted or done when they, um, when they, when they carried out those actions. So Fiji, for example, which is a country with $4,000 uh, per capita income, was talking in its submission about the addiction of people to individual transport options. Now, this was leading to an increase in the private motor car and the people's engines were getting bigger. So in a way, the, 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 the ways of life of the Fijians and the ways in which they, they sought to improve their lives or they sought to live or whatever, was, was seen only in the negative. Um, so only from the point of view of a gas and only um, in a negative. So the, is the opposite of what people would have wanted um, when they were carrying out their actions and buying their cars. Um, so I think these really are the two features. The first of it is the, is the abstraction from a human community, so a, a nation, um, and the rendering of that nation and its activities purely um, in, the, in biophysical terms, in terms of a quantity of gas emitted. So that abstraction from the, the things people want, the reasons why they do things. Um, but then the meaning of that abstraction being the opposite to what people thought um, when they were going about their business the opposite to what the people in that country wanted when they're going about their business. Um, and so the, the international sphere becomes a sphere in which elites do deals among themselves, very much in isolation from their populations, abstraction from their populations, and in opposition to their populations. Um, so that's a bit of Hegel, I suppose. Um, <laughs> um, this, this international sphere is very much a, a prelude now to sort of sovereignty. So, uh, Syria announced recently that it was going to sign the Paris Accord on climate change. Syria, obviously a country where large parts are controlled by different factions, there's no central government, there's no, there's no national economy as such. Um, and yet before they become formed as a nation, before they have a parliament, before they have a national economy, before they have a national economic plan, um, they, they establish themselves through signing of an accord in terms of CO2 emissions. And obviously it's a gestural thing in the sense that Syria cannot control in any way the amount of carbon dioxide emitted from various activities, including bombs. But it's more to a statement of the fact they want to become a nation, which means that they want to enter the international sphere and do de deals with other elites um, almost before they have a relationship with their people and are constituted as a people. So I think that really the, the international sphere of environment has very little to do with actually um, making rational decisions about the way we manage our environment, whether that's on a national level or an international level. Because I think both of those things are entirely possible, entirely good. You know, I think from a nation's point of view, to make decisions about your use of resources, um, to control pollution and the negative impacts of, of um, economic activities or other activities, but also potentially from an international sphere, I think, you know, from the point of view of humanity, there may come a time where the nations of the world would sit down and make decisions about how we would affect the world's climate. And I think, or how we are affecting the world's climate, I think that that is not, that would be a positive thing because we are one species and we do occupy one planet. And so I think, but that in a way, that international committee would be the sum of national popular wills. It would be those national popular wills taken to an international level, um, which is not what we have now. I think that essentially the, the way in which climate change deals are done um, 
are relatively uh, tokenistic and have r relatively little effect on, on, um, on the environment. I think it's more a way in which elites do business with each other and they show their membership of an international committee of elites, which they do so by leaving their peoples behind and almost defying their peoples. Um, I think this is very different because I think this is not a new thing that, that um, political communities would be identified or, or um, oriented in relation to nature or, or natural symbols. You know, it's, it's the first form of social identity is a natural one. So with tribes, the first form of social identity is the totem, which is the animal. So a tribe would very much um, identify with a particular animal and very much see in a way their own characteristics as coming in part from that animal and they would have all uh, injunctions on they couldn't kill the animal, the monkey or the bear or whatever it was, the snake. So I think that you know, the earliest human societies, people who very much um, saw their own identity and the identity of their group in relation to natural forms. And this continued through the first civilizations. So you had in Egypt the uh, identification of the pharaoh with the sun, um, the Nile and the bull. So very much... Um, his authority and his, you know, which was absolute over all the different jurisdictions of, um, of, of the Egyptian king kingdom, was very much related to, to natural authority, so to an idea that he represented the sun and the permanence of the sun or the life-giving qualities of the Nile or the strength of the bull. And, and part of his role was the managing of those elements, so um, the kind of the king originally had the role of, of bringing the rains and making the harvest come and, and that sort of thing, as well as building dams and that sort of thing. But it was believed that they managed nature. Um, so I think this, the, the very much the first forms of political authority and the first forms of social identity are, come from natural forms um, and specific parts of nature that the community um, identified with. So before uh, people could conceive of their association in social terms... They, they essentially used the emblems and the elements of nature um, as a vocabulary, so both for conceiving of themselves and also of justifying relations of the social authority and social command. <coughs> and this continued right um, through into the modern era, so obviously uh, in terms of national identity, very um, great importance to landscape, so in Germany the forests, in England the rolling hills, but very much a nation was kind of attached to and identified with the specific landscape um, that, it, that it occupied. Um, you also see at a kind of, not national level, but within a country, the, the, the use of, of ideas of nature to justify, um, for example, relationships of competition or relationships of, of hierarchy or dominance. So um, capitalist authority at various times has been seen as akin to the laws of nature or to the laws of chemistry um, or, or akin to um, Darwinist kind of um, uh, principles in terms of survival of the fittest and that sort of thing. So, so nature has been used both for a, a form of identifying what was common, also for a, a defending of established social systems, so with, with capitalism and uh, status and, and competition, that kind of thing. And finally, nature's also been used um, in a quite radical way, which you see through the Romantics um, and after, which was basically as the, the unalienated sphere um, to which people could appeal beyond the social system of the day. So nature was the, the realm of vitality and freedom and wholeness. So you're going for a wander in the hills with your notebook and... Um, you know, experiencing the, the, the power of nature, the power of a waterfall. And very much this was the point at which people felt that their senses became alive, that, that they became, you know, not downtrodden and forced into some uh, job they didn't want to be in, but they, they felt um, themselves. And so various political movements have looked to nature in the way that I suppose the Egyptians did or the tribe in terms of a source of vitality. And that's been always what's been sought in nature is, is vitality, energy, um, wholeness, those sorts of things. So very much uh, 
there was a, a, a potentially quite progressive um, use of nature to critique uh, the social relationships of the day in terms of capitalist social relations and, um, and a seeing of a, a rediscovery in the experience of nature of a kind of all-rounded human energy which was then turned back into people's relationships with one another. So in Wordsworth's um, poetry, he kind of goes and encounters nature, but then he comes back to society and brings essentially the renewed energy and the vitality to his relationships with other people. Um, so this is very much uh, the use of nature and, and the identification with nature is, is, has a very long historical trajectory and it has taken different forms at different times. Sometimes it's more um, conservative in terms of justifying authority. Sometimes it's more radical in terms of appealing against authority. Um, but I think the, the continuing appeal of nature since the French Revolution, so since the point at which nations were founded as an explicit social contract, the continuing appeal after that, I think, is to do with the inarticulacy of the nature of modern identity and the difficulty in justifying social arrangements in social terms and critiquing social arrangements in social terms. And so I think that, in a way, the, 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 the problems that have occurred since the French Revolution in terms of conceiving of national um, units and of national popular democracy, the problems have been expressed in terms of the use of natural vocabulary even after that point. Because I would think, I would say that in a sense, nat natural vocabulary had, a, had its place for a certain period of human history. And then after that, in, its, uh, in essence, it wasn't really necessary, but it became used after that point because of the useful role it, it performed. Um, if you look at these previous uses of nature, what's quite striking is um, they're always talking about particular features of particular parts of nature. So, you know, the lushness of a forest or the wildness of a waterfall, the strength of a bull, the, the changing quality of a snake. Um, so there's a particular quality to the natural object that's being observed and used. Um, its strength, its power, its constancy, its changeability. Um, and that, in a way, becomes a muse upon which societies um, conceive of themselves. Um, so it's, essentially it's the thing that they're looking for in themselves that they find in nature. So they want to be strong, they find their inspiration in the bull. Um, they want to be constant, they find their inspiration in the sun. Um, and so these particular parts of nature are related to particular social relationships or qualities that are being defended or expressed or sought. So in a way, there's, there's the, the use of nature as a muse to, um, to reinforce or to pursue certain social bonds. So whether that's the absolute authority of the pharaoh or the, um, the outburst of revolutionary uprising, um, Essentially, it's particular parts of nature and particular social relationships, that there's a relationship between the, the two. Um, so in a way, nature in previous forms is a way in which society becomes conscious of itself um, in an affirmative manner. So it brings parts of its own essence to, to bear. So it kind of looks at itself by saying, we're like the bull. Um, so it becomes conscious of, it, of its qualities, of its aspirations, and that kind of thing. So it's very, it's very affirmative. I think the shift towards, we have, towards what we have today started to occur in the 60s, 70s, and 80s. Um, <coughs> so in the 60s, you had a period where quite a lot of people on the left, um, so people like Murray Bruchkin, is that pronounced right? Strange surname, yep, okay. Um, essentially uh, sought to set up autonomous um, um, communities with solidarity and communal relationships and very much um, sought inspiration to do that from an, I an idea of nature. So an idea of, of nature being, um, being mutualistic and integrated and having kind of you know, close-knit relationships. And so he wanted to build close-knit relationships among his group or with the, among the left. And as a time when, when the political movements were experiencing problems, he sought 
and others saw inspiration in, in nature. So you had a period of finding, again, finding ideals um, that you wanted to pursue um, in natural forms and being inspired by natural forms. Then you had another period, probably more like 70s and 80s, where um, nature became more an expression of loss. So, you know, that was a period where you had lots of um, videos of whales being killed and seals being killed. Um, <coughs> And you had uh, acid rain, concerns about dying forests. I think in all these ways, there was a way in which, obviously, people were concerned about whales and concerned about seals and acid rain, which were, which were real environmental problems. But there was also a way in which these things became emblems of people's and society's sense of loss for themselves. So a sense of things going awry, um, of a nation corroding, um, and I think acid rain is obviously very metaphorical in the sense that you have these statues are getting eaten away and um, buildings getting eaten away. So it's that kind of progressive corrosion element. Um, and actually Ulrich Bech, who's a very smart man, um, did a really good critique of this in the 80s when he was talking about um, the German concern with dying forests. And he said, uh, you know, why forests, why now? His forests have always been dying. Um, and they're dying in places other than Germany. <coughs> and he basically said that essentially the, the role of, reason why it's dying forests in Germany now is because um, the, the sense of, of Germany losing its way and the loss of German national identity at that point. And so that was expressed through the concern with the dying forests. So in a way, Germany, um, the way Germany reflected upon itself and its own kind of sense of, of things fragmenting and falling apart was through um, the concern with the situation for, for, for forests and for trees. So in a way, it saw its own condition in the condition of trees. And so the concern with, with acid rain was not merely a pragmatic one or a practical one, you know, in the way that, um, you know, over the last 200 years particularly, there have been extremely important measures to reduce pollution, whether that's Clean Air Acts or Clean River Acts or Clean Sea Acts. Um, but essentially, uh, you know, recognising there's... Um, there's a negative effect that needs to be, um, needs to be changed and altered and, and nature, um, elements of, of nature restored. Um, I think that the dying forest thing was much more um, uh, existential. And so it was the German nation not solving a problem, but reflecting upon its own sense of loss through the medium of the forests. And Ulrich Berg is very, very good on that. Um, he, he says that... In a way, um, nature, he calls it a, he says that environmentalism is not an environmentalist movement. It's a social inward movement which uses nature as a parameter for certain questions. And he calls it a critique beyond critique. So it's a way of holding to account or holding to consciousness things that you think are limited <coughs> or, um, or negative about your everyday life but to do that in non-social terms. So I suppose you could critique German industry and, and say you know, that the, the, the way German industry is set up is, has led to these polluting practices or whatever. But you do that through the medium of the forest and not through the medium of social critique which stands on its own, own, own feet. And he says that it, environmentalism offers something beyond the double dutch of murky Marxism. So he very much connects... Um, the, the use of environmentalism as a critique um, as something connected to the left and the decline of the left and the decline of the, the, the German nation. <coughs> um, so he talks about the way in which it provides uh, it's a source of injunctions and a guidance on how we should live. It's a time when people wanted guidance on how they should live. So um, to derive guidance from our own wills or to at that point seemed too difficult or impossible and so there was a kind of looking for instruction from some kind of external authority at a time when social authority seemed unreliable nature became that external authority but he makes the point that this is not a real nature but in a way it is it is um words we've put into its mouth things that we wanted to tell ourselves or wanted to assert over other people that we're putting through the mouth of nature. Um, so it's a kind of, it, nature performs the role 
various roles at that point of, of an expression of what's being lost, so expression of angst. Um, so that's the angst of, 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 of the white seal pup being beaten on the white snow and the blood flowing and just the, the symbolism, symbolism of that, or of acid rain corroding things. Um, it also be becomes a, a source of guidance on, on how people should live. I think the current phase we're in, so that, I think that was the intermediary phase between the 60s and the 80s, um, is really since the 90s. Um, and this is the age of, of the New World Order and essentially the post-political, post-national reorganizing of relationships among nations after the end of the Cold War. Um, and you know, very quickly, even before the end of the Cold War, um, in the kind of final stages, the envir environment was becoming um, the means through which uh, nations conducted their, um, their deals and did common business and asserted um, a common order throughout the world. So the basis of the common order was through the management of the environment. So you started to have lots of nations signing contracts to say that they were going to um, manage the environment together. And this was not out of a a genuine growing concern for the environment or, 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 or an actual concerted attempt to take measures in that direction. It was more um, uh, a re, fairly cynical, I think, reorganizing of the power politics um, among, um, national, among national leaders. Um, so in a way, the, the environment became the post-political source of unity between nations and a way in which they could negotiate their relationships outside of the national interest and in isolation from their, from their respective populations. Um, There's a very interesting book published in 1990 by um, Michel Serret, who um, is a French philosopher, and it's called The Natural Contract. And he basically, in, in a quite... Um, quite complete way, uh, says that the social contract, so the contract upon which our societies have been founded, um, is, is dead, is flimsy, is insubstantial, is unreal. Um, and that essentially the, the only way, way on which societies can be refounded is through a contract with nature. So he very much sees nature as as making the social contract defunct. So it's the, he talks about it as um, the noise of nature as, as drowning out the noise of our voices. So we can't speak to each other directly anymore because you, know, you have the, the winds and the hurricanes and the, and the, and the, the force of nature asserting itself as a, as a presence. Um, uh, and he says that you know, the only basis on which societies can be refounded is through a contract with this natural world based on reciprocity and um, on the basis of that, we can refound our relationship to each other. He doesn't go into specifics about how this might be done, but um, he says, um, institutions will henceforth depend on real contracts with the natural world. The fact that the world is entering into a natural contract with the assembled peoples gives the reason for peace as well as the sought after transcendence. Political science would become the geopolitics in the, real, in the sense of the real earth. So political science becomes geopolitics institutions become founded on a relationship to, to nature. Um, and this is very much, I think, that the sort of things you find in that book uh, is, is very much in, in Beck's recent book and also um, some of the stuff Sadol Zizek has done on, on climate change. And there's a number of assumptions um, in this, one of which is that climate change uh, is the thing that makes social relationships defunct. So relationships of class or of nation or solidarity. Now, those things, in my view, declined under their own steam. But in a way, there's a, a re-posing of that in terms of it is the, 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 the force of nature which is making those things um, irrelevant, unnecessary, defunct. So um, it's nature that's asserting itself over previous forms of um, social solidarity um, and, and making those things irrelevant. Sarah Ceres says that, that you know, it's bringing history to, history to an end. Nature is bringing history to an end. And Beck said it's making the nation defunct. 
So that's one role of nature. Basically, it's climate change and, and forms of natural emergency. They make um, the nation class um, irrelevant. The second uh, assumption or, or, or notion is that nature is the means through which um, we can become conscious of the contradictions within our system. So Beck um, talks about the role of the, the gremlin. So the thing that we produce that then becomes a subjective force and, and rebounds back upon us. So it's only through um, carbon dioxide, he would say, that you can become conscious of the limitations of the capitalist system, for example. So it's through the natural inter intermediary and through the, the reverberating effect of pollution back upon your own experience that means that you can understand um, the limitations of those relationships or, or the setups you have. So in a way, the, the, the element, you know, which is the thing that he said before, the element of critique only happens through, through natural forms in that way. And then the final assumption is that nature um, and the management of the climate um, becomes the new basis for political solidarity for um, transnational communities. Um, so here the new, nation, new no notion of the social contract, which is very much that the social bond, the bond between people, cannot arise out of those people themselves. Essentially, it can only um, arise as through... Um, a form of pressure imposed from without. So, you know, like in essentially a <coughs> high pressure situation, people are forced together like atoms that want to keep bounding off each other and bounding apart. But when, when the pressure is put upon them, you know, the, the sea level's rising, the storms are raging, then that's the point at which they will actually work together and form a community. And that's seen as almost like a natural condition to, that people will not work together unless they're forced to through natural emergency. <coughs> So what really happens um, is that the, the social good or the human good cannot be sought directly, but only through the intermediary of, of, of carbon dioxide reductions. So, for example, um, international aid, um, which you know, traditionally was given through, I mean, all sorts of cynical ends, but one would hope to... Um, to help the conditions of, of people in another country. But in various ways, it, it, was, it was justified in social terms. And now you have essentially climate aid. So, so the, the, the aid given to, from countries to other countries or the historic effects of colonialism or economic exploitation are conceived in terms of carbon dioxide inequalities. So the reason why the South is poor is because we've produced carbon dioxide, which has then, through the medium of the skies, been visited upon them. So the direct relationship of exploitation between North and South um, and the way in which um, you know, wealth and labour was extracted is seen through this, the intermediary of, 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 a, of um, a natural gas. And, and by the same accounts, we make amends through the intermediary of a natural gas. So we cut back our carbon dioxide, we provide aid in order for them to limit the effects of carbon dioxide. But at no point do people rate, relate directly face-to-face they only relate through this alienated, um, mediating link, a little bit of Hegel, um, which, is, um, which is carbon dioxide and carbon dioxide reductions. <clears throat> so I think, in a way, the, the way in which climate change has come to occupy um, the, the attempts to produce um, a social good or to ameliorate injustice, um, is a sign of the fact that social relationships cannot be, excuse me, <coughs> um, conceived of um, or challenged on their own on their own terms. So Beck says in um, the Metamorphosis of the World, he says the the norm arises from the public reflection on the horror produced by vic the victory of modernity. <coughs> And he also talks about the good, of the, the good side effects of bad. So you have a bad situation, and actually the good result is that solidarity results from it. <coughs> um, if you compare this to um, the sorts of things I was talking about at the beginning in terms of the historic role of nature, so in the Egyptian pharaoh or the 
the totem of the tribe or the romantic um, <coughs> experience of vital nature. Um, there are a number of, of unusual features uh, to the politics of climate change. Um, one of these is that nature has lost any distinguishing or concrete features. Um, so it's not seen as, so the climate is not a particular part of nature that we experience that is a repository of vitality, power, strength, creativity. <clears throat> so it doesn't have any particular features. It's not a particular part of nature, um, something that nobody experiences. It's invisible, it's abstract something that that's, exists only through measurement. Um, so I think that kind of, the, the loss of, of, of a particular experience of nature and a particular features of nature that are being identified is, is very important. And even a, a step back from, from Gaia, for example, so the idea of the world being uh, uh, a subject called Gaia, um, which is self-regulating and want certain things. So James Lovelock's idea was very much that um, the, the, the planetary system as a subjective power that was interrelated among itself and the seas and the waters and the creatures and <coughs> the earth, essentially that, that was a kind of subjective force which had certain things it wanted and certain things it sought, um, and which is why he used the word of a, of a Greek god because it was very much had that subjective element. So nature is a subject. Um, the climate has lost all features of subjectivity as well. So it's not something that, that wants anything um, or that has any qualities, um, but is very much a kind of blank, abstract measure. And really the only feature of the climate really is that it's the thing, because you know, what is the climate? Um, it's not the atmosphere, it's not the weather, it's not the planet as a whole. It, it's more... in when, when in, in the, in the word climate change, the climate is the element of nature that has been affected in a negative way by our activities. So the interesting climate um, is, is an interest in the, the, the degree to which things have been changed through the emission of carbon dioxide, of anthropogenic carbon dioxide. And there is a kind of reconceiving of all the parts of nature in relation to this climate which is this kind of um, abstract universe of nature in a way. Um, so if you want to research the beaver or whatever, or the penguin, or, then the best thing, that, or increasingly the only thing you can do, is to look at the effects of climate change upon that animal. So in a way, the animal becomes interesting and significant, not in itself, in terms of what it's doing, building its burrows and you know, going about its business or whatever. It's of interest only in as much as it has been affected by the climate which is, of in, which is of significance only as much as it has been negatively affected by what we've done. So there's a sort of um, uh, a blindness now to nature and to, um, you know, people have never been so disengaged from experience with nature and actual concrete um, uh, study of it. And I think that in a way the climate has become the only part of nature it's acceptable to discuss. And the only meaning to that is essentially it's the bit that's been affected by carbon dioxide emissions. So it's, it's of interest only as a, as a bit that's been harmed, I suppose. Um, but again, only in a statistical manner um, uh, and not, not in a kind of concrete or, 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 or real manner. <coughs> so that's one change, I think, that nature has lost any distinguishing features, um, anything we might look to for inspiration or guidance or, um, or, um, or, or any particular qualities. At the same time, there has been the loss of any um, particular social relationships that might be defended, so um, which is obviously the two sides of the same coin. So um, it's not that uh, people are defending the nation or a particular class or particular social ideals of, of, of reciprocity or autonomy or anything. Um, it's a, the, the this, this plane on which climate change negotiations happen. <coughs> is that of essentially um, limiting and negating um, the national product at the very particular level of carbon dioxide emissions. Um, so it, it, it's a question of, of, of making a count of what you've produced and pro providing benchmarks for 5%, 10% reduction or whatever. 
um, and not actually even solving that particular problem in a kind of wholesale manner. I think it would be conceivable that, you know, at a time in the future that, that the nations of the world will sit down and make a decision about, about the, the, um, the world's climate and, and whether that's to do with carbon dioxide emissions or whether we want it a bit warmer or a bit cooler. You know, once we understand actually the, um, the, the effects upon, of the different climates upon different species and their interrelationships and the different periods through which the, the world has gone historically in terms of very dramatic shifts in climate um, and the massive effect that had upon the species in the world. And I think that that would be possible to and desirable in a way that we would grapple with that problem as a human collective or consider our natural environment as a human collective. Um, but I think that climate change negation, that would, that would be a, almost like a raising of, of political community to its highest level. Um, climate, change negation, climate change negotiations are, all, are the absolute opposite of that in the sense that they're a complete negation of the political community and of any kind of notion of, um, of people's will or desires or um, abilities, of any kind of ideal of how it is we want to live or how it is we want to organise ourselves, and also of any kind of concrete experience of nature, any kind of appreciation of nature. You, know, you don't care anymore, actually, about the beaver or the, um, the vole or whatever in themselves, or even mountains or landscapes, because you know, the old environmentalists would be people who, who went tramping around and looking at birds, that was their day, that was their life. I think that now environmentalism has become um, almost like a statistical game. It's almost like, it's like the opposite of, um, it's akin to uh, trading. It's like being a trader, basically. In a way, you would sit in front of your computer and you deal with models and statistics and facts and that kind of thing. You don't go out and experience um, animals and, and natural forms and that kind of thing. So... Um, so it's very much that, um, that distancing from both social relations but also from specific experience of nature and a sense of the value of particular parts of nature. Um, and so it's basically the, the meaning of climate change negotiations is about deals between elites um, which have the only meaning that they have is really as, as the leaving of their people behind and the leaving of the population, the, the national popular behind. <coughs> Um, and so it's not about the management of the planet, but about a distancing themselves between, um, from, from national politics and establishing the basis on which they can no negotiate with other elites um, in a way that's purely on their own terms. Um, so I think this is very much a return to, to, to apolitical forms of negotiation. So um, different in lots of ways, but in ancient Mesopotamia, the political relationships were the relationships between leaders and not between leaders and their people. And I think that, in a way, has become a situation in our times. And that's the case in climate change negotiations, where it's, um, it's a means through which elites negotiate with each other and join an international community, which um, is founded on the opposite of what people would have wanted or what people would have intended by what they did. And so we've reached an unusual point where nature is not, as it has been historically, a form of affirmation of a particular society. So where in which society became conscious of what it was, what it wanted, um, what it felt, but it's a form of negation of a particular society. So it's, um, it's the, the, the kind of abstract um, opposite and, and distancing from social relationships and social goals. <laughs>